All right, welcome to the Eastern Question Lecture Series. Uh, we're now on our second, uh, second week or our second session. As you recall, last week we covered the introduction and the history. Uh, for a quick recap, so you'll know where we are today. Today, of course, is the 11th, and we're going to talk about Constantine and the Eastern Question and how Constantine played a major role in the Eastern Question. And again, what we said before, we're going to go next week, we're going to talk about Napoleon in the Eastern Question. You'll see some bits and pieces, or you'll hear some bits and pieces of how Napoleon um, studied what Constantine uh, and uh, um, others thought about the Eastern Question. And then the following week, which is the 25th of Europe, we're going to talk about that which is extremely important to Seventh-day Adventists, Europe in the Eastern Question, and how the Seventh-day Adventist Church really got, it, got propelled um, from obscurity to notoriety. And then we're going to talk about in the following week World War I and World War II and see how the Eastern Question played uh, an important role uh, in the decisions of many world leaders at the time. And then finally the last week which will be November the 8th we will talk about the return of the Eastern Question. Now we all know from the article that I showed last week that many um, journalists already are familiar or have made it clear that the Eastern Question has returned. And the fact of the matter is, it's not that the Eastern Question has returned, it's just that the Eastern Question has not made the headlines as it had made during the previous, um, probably prior to the early 1900s. And so now, as we look at the Eastern Question and its role in current events, and its role in end time events, um, let us pray, let us pray, we open up with prayer and get right into Constantine and the Eastern Question, Constantine and the Eastern Questions. Let us have a word of prayer, if you will. Father in heaven, we thank you again for this day and the blessings. We thank you, Father, for safe travels that you've allowed us to make it here, and we pray, Father, for those who are on their way that you would hasten their steps and that you would send angels that exceed with power and with strength to be with them. We pray also, Lord, that you will be with amongst us, for your word tells us where two or three are gathered in your name, there you will be in the midst. So, Father, be with us, keep us, order our steps in your way. Remove me that that which is said is that which you would have your people to hear, how prophecy and history are inextricably linked. Be with us is our prayer we ask. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So um, if we remember, remember, we said, we said last week, and I didn't get any disapproval, I didn't get any disagreement, not, no one disagreed at all that prophecy and history are tied together and that prophecy tells us what history says has already happened. In other words, when we look at prophecy, we are actually looking at something that is going to happen. And that's what makes the Seventh-day Adventist Church, or that's what made the Seventh-day Adventist Church a remarkable movement. It was an, a movement that said we trust God, we take him at his word, not only because we were just taking a stab in the dark, but because we had history on our side. And so as we address this issue, as we address this issue of the Eastern question, as we address all the history we've talked about so far, we have to make sure that, because the, remember the questions that I gave you, the first question was what? Do you remember? What was the first question? The first question was, what was the Eastern question? Because if you understand the Eastern question, you're going to actually be like the weatherman, being able to tell the weather. You can look at the events, and there's going to be, I'm going to show you something shortly. I actually get chills as I'm getting prepared to, to show you some of these things. If you understand the Eastern question, you are actually going to be like the weatherman from a world event standpoint. And so, again, I want to make sure we review this. And so we look here and the question is, what briefly stated is the Eastern question? If you didn't get the answer from last week, this is just a quick couple of slides review and we boom, we're going right ahead. What briefly stated is the Eastern question? Now. We're using Bible readings for the home circle, the original 1888 version of this book. 
And if you look, and we're going to talk about this as well, the 1888 version, right after the Eastern question, came the definition of the seven trumpets of Revelation 8 and 9. So that, that's, these right here are so linked, the Eastern question and the seven trumpets, and we're going to talk about that also today, and how Constantine played a major role, beloved. Constantine played a major role in six of the seven trumpets. And so we see here in Bible readings for the home circle, it says, the, what briefly stated is the Eastern question, and it's this, the driving out or the expulsion of Turkey from Europe and the final extension of the Turkish Empire. Now, when you use this word extinction, when an animal becomes extinct, that means it's gone. It's no more around. And so there is an objective in Europe to make sure that Turkey not only is removed from the easternmost part of Europe, but removed completely, and the people of Turkey are to be made extinct, because that's what the term says. Now, remember, as we defined last week, the children of Ishmael will be here until the end of the sixth trumpet. So this is a pipe dream at best by those who are wishing that this would happen. As we continue, it says, with the world embracing events that follow, or whatever happens after Turkey has been run out, or the people of Turkey have been run out of that physical or geographical land. It has been otherwise described as the driving of the Turk into Asia and a scramble for his territory. So there are two things that are included in here, getting Turkey out and getting that territory. Selfish reasons, selfish reasons. Brother Henry? Did you mean to say the sixth plague instead of the sixth trumpet? Sixth trumpet, I'm sorry, thank you. I meant the sixth trumpet. There are seven trumpets that we're gonna talk about, okay? For a short, brief time when we talk about it. So it's the, so Turkey, no, I'm sorry, I stand corrected. It's the sixth plague. It's the sixth plague. I thought I, thought I right. It's, we're in the seventh trumpet now. It's the sixth plague. And I'm, uh, because I've been working on this, I got trumpets and plagues all mixed up in my head. So it's the sixth plague that brings the end of the Turkish Empire. It's the sixth plague. And actually, and, and because we are talking among friends, okay. all right. And so we see here, there is an objective of European nations and now collectively most of the world nations want to see the people of Turkey driven out. Continuing, in Bible readings for the home circle, it says, what scriptures, this is an answer to a question I, I may well ask, what scriptures are devoted to the Turkish power? And the Bible readings for the home circle, 1888 version, you know 1888 was an extremely important time for the Seventh-day Adventist church. And so when we look at the 1888 version, it answers it. It says Daniel 11, 40 to 45, and Revelation 9, and Revelation 16 and 12. So there are three lines of scripture that talk about the Turkish power in scripture. And it says, note, in the 11th chapter of, Dan of, of Daniel, Turkey is dealt with under the title of the king of the north. In Revelation 9, under the bounding of the fifth and sixth trumpets. And in Revelation 16, under the symbol of the drying up of the water of the chief river of the Tur Turkish Asiatic possessions, the great river Euphrates. The actual drying up of the river Euphrates was the signal for the overthrow of the ancient, of ancient Babylon. That's the literal. So I want, to, I want to talk about something because I've gotten questions about how did we forget how did we as a church get to a point where we stop embracing these things? How did we as a church get to a point where we didn't remember our past? Because if we look at ourselves as a church and say, well, how did we get to this point? Then we can find out how do we, how do we grab a hold to our past so we can understand the future. I, um, is anyone familiar with the annual council meetings, the annual council meetings? You know they were just held last week? Just held this weekend. Just this weekend. And they had a question and answer session. And it was amazing they told us what happened. And I'm going to show you. Here, this right here. Welcome to the 2017 annual counting. This just happened Friday, Sabbath, and Sunday. And look at what they say as to how they got or how we got to where we are now. Listen to this. They asked a question, what, what, what body authorized the contents of the first 
General Conference Working Policy. You ever, are anyone familiar with the General Conference Policy Manual? Brother Mike, you, you saw it when I hit it. The General Conference Policy Manual is about that thick. It's about 700 pages. It's not the church manual. It's called the General Conference Policy Manual. It was something that was brought into the church, and it tells you what year. What body authorized the contents of the first General Conference Working Policy? I just got this offline. The 1926 General Conference session voted to refer the responsibility of producing a working policy to the General Conference Executive Committee. That practice has continued over most of the policy's history. And so since 1926, when did Loughborough die, brothers and sisters? You remember? 1924. 1924. So after, remember we said, that after the last pioneer passed off the scene, changes came. This is from their document. They said in 1926, they adopted a working policy manual. They adopted a working policy manual. And that is the practice that we have continued today. All right, this one's a little tougher. What reasons were given for producing the first General Conference working policy? Um, you can give them their choice. There's more than one correct answer here. Do you remember any of the, any of the reasons given? Memory was failing and there were no records. All right, the faulty memory, yes. Thank you. We have someone else? Okay, different regions were, were doing things differently and it was to bring them together and, and unify the process. Okay, that's pretty much the, the same idea. Right, they had lost the collective memory. It wasn't just their own memory was failing, but they didn't have that history as the, the older leaders were going on. Um, so I... I ah, that's, a, that's another good reason. So um, there's a few, a few here, uh, to collect, systemize, standardize the policies, and uh, we've, mentioned, we've mentioned the... Memory no longer served effectively. In other words, because there was no one around who remembered how the church had operated in the past, they decided they wanted to adopt a working policy manual, and that became the standardized way of operating the church instead of the way the church had operated before. In other words, since all the pioneers had passed off the scene and because no one had had any real relationship with the older leaders, they said we have to come up with another way of running this organization. They forgot their past. This is an admission. He admitted that there was no collective memory. Did you hear him say that? So in other words, as a church, they forgot their history. Brothers and sisters, can we continue to go on with the forgotten history? We have to understand our history. And so, as we look at what we were talking about, now we can see how we got to the point to where it, had, it started back in the 1920s, as early as 1926. And I'm glad that we don't have visitors because it, I can be a little more freely free about what I say. And so, as we looked at this last, hmm? and so as we looked at this last week. We talked about two kinds of prophecy. One is predict predictive prophecy, which was what the prophets did back in the Old Testament, and John the Revelator did, and Paul to a certain degree. They said what was going to happen. But then we have historical prophecy, and that is historically, historically looking back at what has happened in the past and say, oh, this is what God said was going to happen, and it did happen. That's the, those are the two kinds of prophecies you have. What made us unique as a church, what made us unique as a people, was we looked forward with the prediction in 1838 and said, this is what's going to happen. And that is what made this, that which became the Seventh-day Adventist church a noteworthy people. It made people say, these people must know what's talking about. And so now we come to a point in our own existence as a church, as we have one last prophecy to, deter, to, to prophesy about. One last prophecy. The three angels' messages is just that. It's a message. Babylon is falling. Babylon is falling, was said in Daniel 
two. I mean, Daniel 14 and 8, that's the second angel's message. We have one more prophecy, and that is Daniel 11.45. Daniel 11.45, and we know what Daniel 11.45 says, right? Let's turn our Bibles to Daniel 11.45. Daniel 11.45, because this is the prophecy that answers the Eastern question. This is the final answer to the Eastern question. And when you have your Bibles open, I mean, when you're there, say amen, and we can go ahead. Wow. Daniel 11.45. Well, I'm going to go ahead and keep moving. Daniel 11.45 says, And he shall plant the tabernacle of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountains, yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. That, brothers and sisters, is the last prophecy. That prophecy answers the question, or rather, the Eastern question. And so, as we look at the Roman Empire and the Ottoman Empire, we will see that both entities have played a key role in world events, whether they were past, whether they're right now, or whether they're the future especially since the Ottoman Empire became the kingdom which controlled the geography that, that most strikingly resembles the Roman Empire. Now, as we look at this, past, present, and future. Think about the Ottoman Empire, past, present, and future. And when you look in the Bible readings for the home circle, this is the page. This opens up the Eastern question. It has a picture of Russia trying to gain control of Turkey and how would this all end up happening? How will this all be manifested? Well, well, these two entities that play a role or will play a role in the final answer for what's going on geographically and time, it does not remove, brothers and sisters, and we'll show in a few moments, it does not remove the papacy from what it has to do. The papacy is going to do what it's going to do. We're looking for benchmarks. We're looking for harbingers. We're looking for signposts to say to us, what should I be doing right now? And as you see Turkey and world events, you're going to see what you should be doing right now. As a matter of fact, earlier this year, earlier this year on May the 9th, 2017, this was in Breitbart. Now, some people may say fake news, but they know something that's going on. May 9th, 2017, this was what was printed in Breitbart, but it was in a couple other news as well. Erdogan, does anyone know who Erdogan is? Erdogan is the president of Turkey, okay? Turkey used to be what? What was, what was Turkey called at one time? I want to make sure we're not asleep here. What was Turkey at one time called, or what was it part of? The Ottoman Empire. And so Erdogan, who is the president of Turkey, or what used to be the Ottoman Empire, what does it tell us right here? Erdogan, president of Turkey, Ottoman Empire, king of the north, urges Muslims to what? Swarm Temple Mount to save Jerusalem from Judaizing, Judaization. In other words, he's telling Muslims to start making your way to Israel. Start making your way to Israel. Brother Henry? I don't know if you got this out of the line there, but he's talking about uh, telling them, like you're saying, telling the Muslims uh, to take them, to reoccupy. Speak up, speak up. Mm -hmm. Oh, come on, Mike. Well, I'll keep going and you raise your hand back. So what, what Turkish President Erdogan on Monday, on Monday the 9th urged Muslims to visit the Temple Mount to act as a counter to the insult of occupied Jerusalem. Turkey says, Israel is what? Come on. What is Turkey saying about Israel or the, peop or the people that are in that land? But what, 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 what position have they taken? They are occupying. They have taken over a land that Turkey or the Ottomans still feel belongs to them. He says occupied, right? Is it, does that make sense? Okay, so he's saying to them it has to act as a counter to the insult of occupied Jerusalem and call Israel a racist and discriminatory state that is reminiscent of apartheid. So what Erdogan is saying is we want to take back the land that was at one time ours. And we'll talk about that when we get into World War I and World War II. Brother Mike? Yeah, he's calling for uh, Muslims to take over Jerusalem, and he's also talking about reestablishing the Ottoman Empire. Thank you. Brothers and sisters, this thing is moving so fast. I, I, that, oh, I wish I had all night. We, would, we wouldn't get finished. 
Here's another statement. Now remember what we, the last slide I showed you last week was Peter the Great telling his successors what to do, right? And I do have those, I do have those DVDs. He was telling them what to do. Now let's see if his successors have listened to him. Let's see if the, one of his most present successors have listened to him. Who is this? That's Putin. And this is in the Spectator magazine and it says how Putin came to rule the Middle East. The date of this is October 7th, 2017. Does the world know that the Eastern question is still an issue? Who were the people who brought the Eastern question back into the mindset of the, of the world? It was the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And so when we brought it back, we went to sleep. And, the, and, the, and the, 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 the brother said, we've lost our collective memory. God is trying to give it back to each and every one of us. He wants each and every one of us to remember our past so that he can use us to give these messages. And this article, and this, in this article it says, speaking of how Putin, they don't know, or maybe they do know, I cannot speak to that. Putin is executing exactly what Peter the Great said. Putin has just inked a deal with Turkey, which has NATO's second largest standing army. Turkey is NATO's second largest standing army. The number one largest standing army in NATO is the United States. So think about it. Turkey is not even in the Atlantic Ocean. NATO means North Atlantic Treaty Organization. So how does an organization that's not even in the Atlantic become a part of NATO? These are things that, our, that, that as people who understand the history of the Eastern question, we would know and know that we're moving closer and closer to that last event. It says Turkey, now speaking of how t Putin had inked this deal to sell military weapons to Turkey, the second largest standing army of NATO. That doesn't even make sense because NATO and Russia seem to be or would be at odds. But for Turkey to be able to purchase from, from the, the Russians, it says something is amiss between NATO and Turkey. Secondly, he says, the author says, Turkey has shot down one of Russia's planes. Remember that? Now right there, and they didn't apologize for it. It took a long time, remember? He goes on and says, Turkey had shot down one of the planes. It was a deliberate attempt to provoke a wider war by President Erdogan. So in other words, we see the Eastern question getting stronger, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> and stronger and stronger. Continue, it says, it is a testament to Putin's extraordinary diplomatic skills that Russia and Turkey are these days singing each other's praise as never before. And under Russian's auspices or direction, Turkey is working with Iran and Iraq. The Eastern question is back. I don't know how many people got this this week. I'm, I'm trying to make sure we get everything that I send out. But this was in the news just a day or two ago, and my wife actually was the one who brought it to my attention. I hadn't even seen this. Turkish tanks are poised along the Syrian border, waiting to start an operation in Syria's Idlib province. That area is one of the de-escalation zones that have been agreed to by Iran, Turkey and Russia within the framework of the Astana talks. It is one of four de-escalation zones, but it is expected to be one of the harder ones to go in and establish because of the presence of a group called the HTS, that is Hayat Tahrir al-Sham. The group is better known by its former name, the Nusra Front. The Al-Qaeda-affiliated group has taken over control of large swaths of territory in Idlib province, pushing out anti-rebel groups that have been fighting the regime of Bashar al-Assad. They are a complicating factor because Russia and Iran back the Syrian government forces and Turkey has influence over the FSA, but the HTS is not a part of the agreement and they have come out and threatened FSA units that are supposed to take part of the Turkish operation into Idlib province. This uh, de-escalation zone is 
vital for the civilians who are living in Idlib province. It is one of the most populated areas remaining in northern Syria. It saw an influx of people who came in after uh, intense fighting in Aleppo. So whether or not this operation is successful and whether or not the de-escalation zone is established will determine whether or not civilians who have already been through so much in Syria will have a little bit of a respite there. CNN. So you see that Turkey is at the border of Syria. And after you get through Syria, what's the next country? Israel. Israel. And so Turkey has now entered into an agreement with Russia, Iran, and Iraq, giving them permission to go ahead and be along the border of Syria and ultimately go through Syria. And the Eastern question, brothers and sisters, the answer to it is getting closer and closer and closer. So as we continue looking at the Eastern question, where did we find the earliest roots of the Eastern question? Now, you saw what Putin is do doing. We saw the news article, right? Mm -hmm. and we also see what Turkey is doing. Amen? So now let's see. We're gonna, this is just a refresh of what Peter the Great said back in the late 1600s. We, st we, we showed this last week. Peter the Great said this. This was his last will and testament. He said, this is what every czar after him was to do. To take every possible means of gaining Constantinople. They understood the value of it. And the Indies or India. For he who rules there will be the true sovereign of the world. Excite war continually in what countries? Turkey, Turkey and Persia. What country is Persia today? Iran, established fortresses in the Black Sea. The Black Sea sits between Turkey and Russia. Get control of the sea by degrees, and also of the Baltic, Baltic Sea, which is a double point necessary to the realization of our project. Accelerate as much as possible to the decay of Persia and penetrate to the Persian Gulf. Reestablish if possible by the way of Syria the ancient commerce or the ancient um, means of um, buying and selling of the Levant. The Levant is where Israel is. Advance to the Indies. So he's saying, go down and expand, which are the great deposit of the world. Once there, in either of those locations, we can do without the gold of England. So what Peter the Great was saying to his successors, don't worry about England. If you get control of this land, then you don't have to worry about gold because you're going to have everything. As a matter of fact, those with gold will be coming to you because you will have all the resources. And so, beloved, Peter the Great understood the Eastern question. He understood that the answer to the Eastern question was controlling what? Turkey. Controlling Constantinople, you answer the Eastern question. But God said what? What did, God, what did we learn last week from what God's word was? No one will control it until the end. And when the end comes, it'll be too late. And so as we look at Constantine and his role, Constantine and his role, Constantine, as we said last week, understood that where Constantinople stood or where it sits, there are three continents that all connect to Turkey. But he wasn't, the, he wasn't the last person that understood this. In fact, when we look at Constantine, after Constantine understood it, then Peter the Great understood it. And then after Peter the Great understood it, then Napoleon understood it. These are all people who have tried throughout history to be masters of the entire planet. And then from Napoleon, the next person to come on the scene who really tried to do it was Kaiser Wilhelm. He was the, he was the Kaiser, he was the emperor of the German Empire. And he was the person who really got started or started World War I by trying to get control of Turkey. And then we see here Adolf Hitler. Most people don't know that World War I and World War II were closely connected to someone trying to gain control of Constantinople and establishing commerce lines between Constantinople and wherever their country was because whatever, whoever controlled that part of the world would control commerce. And now we see 2017, who's trying to control it now? Right now. But ultimately, brothers and sisters, don't think that it stops at Putin because the papacy 
desire is to control Turkey. It's their desire. And we're going to show that in just a few minutes. Just a few minutes. And so when we look at Constantine and how Constantine came on the scene, history and prophecy tells us what Constantine would do that set this Eastern question up. Turn your Bibles with me to Daniel 11.24. Daniel 11.24. And we'll see how Constantine came about setting up this Eastern question issue. And when you have it, say amen. 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 All right. Daniel 11.24 says, He shall enter peaceably upon the fattest places of the provinces. That's talking about Caesar. And then it has a semicolon that says, And he shall do, this means another person, this means it separates it. And this one says, And he shall do that which his fathers have not done. Have not means, in other words, the person who's given this prophecy is saying that no one before him had done what, he's going, he, what he did. And he shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers or his predecessors. He shall scatter among them the prey and spoil and riches. Yea, and he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds even for a time. Daniel 11, 24. What does all that say right there? What does all that say that right there? Basically, we're talking about the time frame that prophecy gives from when Caesar was, was killed or when Caesar died in, in um, 31 B.C. And how long is a time, Bible st prophecy students, how long is a time? A, a time times and a half. How long is a time? 360 years. And so from, 11, from 31 B.C., 360 years forward, we should see something being done by someone in the Roman Empire that had never been done before. And if you take 331 and you subtract it from 360, and remember there's no year zero, if you take 331, I mean, if you take 331 when Constantine moved his empire from Rome to Constantinople and you subtract 31 years from that, you get the year 300, the 330. So Constantine, according to prophecy, says, and he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds. He moved against what he was doing even for a time or 360 years. So when he did it, it was 360 years from the time of Caesar. And so we see here by Stephen Haskell, he says, speaking of this land, in the story Pioneer writer says, it has been the contested point among the nations of Europe since the continent has had nations to contend. And according to the prophecy of Daniel, it will be the bone of contention to the end of time. It was founded in the year 330 AD, exactly 360 years, a time after the victory of Octinium over Antony and Oct at Actium. Because remember, it was because they killed Caesar, and then the, the person who succeeded Caesar was his, was his um, stepson. His stepson, um, Caesar, the, the, the next Caesar, and, and Antony fought against each other, and Cleopatra and Anthony worked together. And so it was, it was Caesar Octavius who fought against Anthony and Cleopatra in 31 AD. And so it says, after the victory of Octavius over Antony at Actium, which placed him as sole ruler of the Roman throne. So when... Caesar Oct Oct Octavius in 31 AD conquered Antony and Cleopatra 300, 360 years later was when Constantine did something that his fathers had never done before. And what was that? He moved the capital of the Roman Empire that stood there for a, since the 700s, from 700 to 300, almost a thousand years, he moved the capital. But Constantine didn't realize what he was doing. He was doing something that he wanted to do, but he didn't realize that he was fulfilling prophecy because the prophecy says in Daniel 11, 25, I'm sorry, Daniel 11, hold on, Daniel 11, 24, and he shall peaceably, no, no, um, yeah, and he shall enter peaceably even upon the fattest places of the province, and he shall do that which his fathers have not done. Constantine was not doing this because he was thinking about setting a different precedent. He was doing it from a strategic standpoint. And it says here, uh, the story of Daniel the prophet, again by Stephen Haskell, he says, 
he indeed performed that which neither his father nor his father's fathers had performed. He left to his heirs or his sons a new capital. Rome was no longer the capital. Constantine was the capital. So that was something new that he left for his sons. He left a new policy. In other words, they were trying to go even further than ever before. And a new religion because he left one religion over, on, over in Rome and he adopted a new one, which was Greek Orthodox. No one had before dared to think that Rome could be quitted or Rome could be left. Constantine selected the site of Constantinople with more than human wisdom. Let that sink in for a second. He chose that land with more. It wasn't, he didn't get the inspiration to do that from some human being. Because how do you look at Constantinople and realize that you got Asia, Asia Minor, you got Africa, and you got Europe, all of those areas, all those continents around that area. Something had to inspire him. I don't think it was the Lord. It is formed by nature to be the center and capital of a great monarchy. So when Constantine moved from Rome to Constantinople, he was upsetting the balance of things. He was drawing attention to what was going on. Um, John Clark Ridpath says this, a different historian, a different historian. He says, with the establishment of the empire of the capital of the Roman Empire at Constantinople, a great tide of population set in the thitherward from the west. What does that mean? This is a class. So what does that mean? Let's look at what it says. With the establishment, okay, he moved his empire that was at the capital of Rome to Constantinople. A great tide of population set in that direction from the west. So what, it, so what did that mean? Come on. The people, moved. the people started moving. In other words, like I said last week, if you move, what is the biggest business in Washington, D.C.? Government. If the, if the government of Washington, if the government of the United States moved from Washington, D.C. and moved to, let's say, Tennessee, what are, the, what are the people who live in Washington, D.C. who have business to do with the government going to do? They're going to move with it. And so, see, Rome was like a big fat cow with a lot of udders. And everybody was drinking from Rome. And when Rome moved, everyone else started moving as well. Artisans, skilled labor, regular people, crooks, you name it. Everyone was moving from Rome to Constantinople. And as a result of that, it was a, um, a, there was great was the gain from an administrative point of view of the transfer of the seat of government. Rome, Rome, the city Rome was what? Displaced. Why was Rome displaced? All the population left Rome. So how do you feel if you're Rome and Constantine takes all the population and all the along with him eastward? And so Rome was displaced from the geographical center of the imperial dominion. In other words, Rome was no longer the center. Now Constantinople became the geographical center. He continues and says, Constantinople was a natural focus. Around her lay the provinces of the empire. Within her walls was gathered the remaining culture of the Greeks. So you had people coming from Rome with their culture and adding to that you had the Grecian culture together Three continents lay at her feet. So you had two cultures coming together and they were able to distribute or disseminate Roman and Greek doctrine and Roman and Greek edu education and religion to those three continents and whomever else around the world. History of the World, John Clark Whitpath, Volume 3, page 977. Here's another historian that says the exact same thing. See, prophecy said this was going to happen, but history says it did. The question of Asiatic Turkey is undoubtedly a far more difficult question than that of Constantinople. It goes beyond Constantinople. The Eastern question has to go beyond Constantinople in, in order for it to be a question that the rest of the world wants to know an answer to. The importance and value of Asiatic Turkey can scarcely be over-exaggerated, for it occupies undoubtedly the most important strategical position in the world. This is a historian saying this. He's saying it, is, it occupies undoubtedly the most important strategical position in the world. It forms the nucleus and center of the old world. 
it separates and at the same time connects Europe, Asia, Africa, three continents which are inhabited by approximately at the time he wrote this in 1914. Europe, Asia, and Africa, they, inhab they were inhabited by nine tenths of the human race. Was that a, is, is it, at that time was the Eastern question a pretty big question? Amen. And so when he moves, when he moves and does this, he creates a void or he creates, uh, he creates this draft in Rome that did not bode well for that, not only for the Romans, but also for God. Turn your Bibles with me to Revelation 13 and 2. Revelation 13 and 2. And we'll see what happens here. Because this right here opens up a can of worms for world empires. Revelation 13 and 2. Let me know when you got it. Okay. Now, what year did Constantine move his government? We just said it. What year was it? 330 A.D. So Revelation 13 and 2 is going to point us to 330 A.D. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the uh, right. dragon gave him his power and his seat and his great authority. So when Rome, excuse me, when the, when the Roman Empire moved from Rome to Constantinople, they left their seat in Rome. And in other words, the power that was a void was filled by the papacy. What is the old, Brother Henry has presented this before, what is the old emblem of the Roman Empire? The dragon. So the dragon gave him his power because the dragon is actually working behind Rome, but the dragon gives Rome, the papacy, its power, his seat, and its great authority in the Roman Empire. And so Roman, I'm sorry, in, in Rome, not the Roman Empire, but in the geographic, geography of Rome. So the papacy is over here in Rome. But I should turn and do it, put it this way because the papacy is over here in Rome and Constantinople is over here. And so that which was here, which was controlled by the Roman Empire, is, has now fallen into the hands of the papacy. That's why the Bible says, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and the great authority. This was in 330 AD. So Constantine's departure from Rome opened the door for the papacy and the persecution of true Christians by paganized Christianity. And as a result, as a result when this happened, brothers and sisters, God began to retaliate. God began to place some control or at least let Rome know that what they were doing was not acceptable to God. Turn your Bibles with me to Revelation 8 and 2. Revelation 8 and 2. When Rome did this, when the Roman Empire did this, it opened up and allowed for the papacy to start persecuting the true Christians. And in retaliation for doing this, Rome said, I'm going to, God said, I'm going to destroy the Roman, the papal, I mean, the pagan Roman Empire. And we see this in Revelation 8 and 2. You there? Revelation 8 and 2 in the Bible says, And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them was given what? Seven, seven trumpets. And which trumpet are we in right now? Seven. We're in the seventh trumpet. So these angels are the angels that blew the preceding six and the seventh trumpet of which time we're in. Will you go ahead and say something, Brother Mike? Okay. So let's look at this real quick because remember when we showed, that, we showed those two legs of iron, one leg represented the west and one leg represented the east. And so God goes about, and Revelation 8, the destruction of first the, the western portion of the Roman Empire. And the Bible tells us, the first trumpet, which is represented, in, and you don't have to write all this down, I'm just letting you see how Constantine caused the eastern question to come up on the scene. The first trumpet, the first trumpet, of the seven that we just talked about that's in Revelation 8 and 2, the first trumpet represents a group of barbarians called the Goths. They began the destruction of the Roman Empire in the West. Then the second trumpet came and the Vandals. This is another separate study, but you need to see how God retaliated against Constantine. Against Constantine. The second trumpet was the Vandals. And you can see the scriptures that I refer to. Revelation 8, 6, and 7 are the Goths. Revelation 8, 8 and 9 are the vandals. That's the second trumpet. 
Revelations 8, 10, and 11 is the third trumpet. This is all Seventh-day Adventist history. We all understood this like the palm of our hands. And the third trumpet was the Huns. And then the fourth trumpet were the Haruli. Those were the four, those were actually the six barbarian tribes that came down and destroyed the Roman Empire in the West. So what God was doing, he was retaliating to con against Constantine for allowing the papacy to have control and persecute the, the, the Christians. Then when we go over to Revelation 9, we see, which we're talking about now, all this was caused by Constantine moving his empire. God was retaliating against Constantine moving his empire. And so the fifth trumpet comes, and we have the beginning of the Arabs, and now that's in what part of the Roman Empire? Are we here? The eastern part. And so the West has been destroyed. By 476, the Western Empire was destroyed. But, it, but, in, but in 632, now God uses the Muslims. He brings the Muslims on the scene, or rather the Arabs, and then the Muslims on the scene, because the Arabs become Muslims. And he uses the Arabs, and then the Turks, the fifth trumpet being the Arabs, they were loosely organized, or hardly organized, but in the sixth trumpet, it was the Turks who became organized. And so you have six trumpets, the barbarians, and then the, the Muslims or the Arabs, but we're now in the seventh trumpet. And each time you see a trumpet, that means there means some kind of a war because a trumpet in Bible means either memorial or war. And in these cases, each one of them meant God was declaring war on the Roman Empire. And we're right now in the seventh trumpet, and that trumpet represents the remnant church, and it went from what year? 1844 until the end of time. In the book Fox's Book of Martyrs, in the book Fox's Book of Martyrs, anyone who's read the book Fox's Book, book of Martyrs? Brother Henry knows. So I'm not going to be saying something at least Brother Henry can't, can't confirm. During the time of the pagan empire, beloved, the Christians, even though they knew the pagan empire was coming to it, was going to come to an end, they said we'd rather the persecution that comes from the pagans continue than what's coming next. Because they knew that when whoever succeeded the pagans was going to be ten times worse than the pagans. And thus in the book Fox's Book of Martyrs we see, thus far, speaking of prior to Constantine moving his empire, causing this eastern question, thus far our history of persecution, the Christians, has been confined principally to the pagan world. We come now to a period when persecution under the guise of Christianity committed more enormities than ever disgraced the annals of paganism. In other words, this, the papacy disgraced paganism as bad as they were. Disregarding the maxims and the spirit of the gospel, the papal church, arming herself with the power of the sword, vexed the church, the Christian church of God, and wasted it for several centuries. A period most appropriately termed and the history, the dark ages. The kings of the earth gave their power to the beast and submitted to be trodden on by the miserable vermin that often filled the papal chair, as in the case of Henry, emperor of Germany. The storm of papal persecution first burst upon the wildernesses in France. And so we look back, we see that even though all these things were used by God to Revenge against the, against, against the Roman Empire, it did not make a difference. It did not change the way the papacy was. Although every single one of them, the Goths, the Vandals, the Huns, the Herulis, the Ostrogoths, the Visigoths, all of them sooner or later, brothers and sisters, actually ended up succumbing to the papacy. In fact, A.T. Jones says it the following way. He says, the first four trumpets marked the downfall of the Western Empire of Rome. The fifth and sixth marked the destruction of the Eastern Empire of Rome. And the seventh trumpet marks, this is where you and I are involved, the seventh trumpet marks the downfall of all empires, all kingdoms, and all nations. For when the God of heaven sets up its kingdom, sets, sets up his kingdom, it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. That's Daniel 9, I mean 2 and 44. 
The woe of the fifth trumpet was called by Gibbon the shipwreck of nations, but the woe of the seventh trumpet will be not only the shipwreck of, na wreck of nations, but of the great globe itself. So here is an example, just so you'll see what happened. First, in the west, this, this is a compass showing north, south, west, east, or east-west. In the west, you had the destruction by the barbarians. That's a, baby, a, a pagan Rome. And then in the east, you had the destruction by the Mohammedans. And what, what happens after that, brothers and sisters? What happens after that is a group of people who come on, that's gone, and our work will be to give a message that will cause the fall of Babylon, and that message will not only cause the fall of Babylon, but it will also cause the fall of the world. That's what we have to do, brothers and sisters. That's what our message is. And so as we look at this, just to recap, because you need to understand this, the first four trumpets going from 395 to 471 was the destruction of the Western Roman Empire, and Revelation 8, 6 to 12 covers it. And then you have the second, the second three trumpets. Oops, slide's moving too slow. Come on. No, let's go to Revelation 18 and 3. Let's go to Revelation 8 and 3 real quick. Go back, go back. Revelation 8 and 13. Revelation 8 and 13. 8, 13. Revelation 8, 13. And so the first th four trumpets represent, as we said, the destruction of the Western world, the Western part of the Roman Empire. And the second f two trumpets represent the destruction of the Eastern Roman Empire. But there's something that's in here that's so important because we now live in the time of one of these particular words. The Bible says in Revelation 8, 13, And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, what? Whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa, whoa. To the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the vo other voices of the trumpet of the what? Angel. Of the what? Th how many angels? Three. Three angels. Three angels. Let's read that again. I want to make sure you get this. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices, other voices of the trumpet of the three angels. In other words, when you get to the third woe, when you get to the seventh trumpet, there are going to be three angels doing what? Giving the three angels message. Giving the three angels message. And so we're in the time of the third woe, the seventh trumpet, and we are the ones who have to give the three angels messages. There it is in Revelation 8.13. It says, to the inhabitants of the earth, by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, what? Which are yet to sound. In other words, by the, when, you, when we enter into this time of those first six angels, God wants, wants the world to know that there's still going to be three angels that are going to give a message in the time of woe. I thought I saw a question. And so, when 813 happens, it's, it's telling us that the first four are over and the last two of those trumpets, the last two of those six trumpets have, will come to their end and then we enter into the time of the seventh trumpet. And that seventh trumpet, brothers and sisters, think about it. The, the, that, that, that seventh trumpet and the woe is associated with the, the Muslims or the Arab Empire. And the three woes are associated also with the Arab Empire. And so in the time of the first, it introduces them. In the time of the second, it shows you how dangerous they are. But in the third, it also shows you, brothers and sisters, that the Muslims will be here until that woe is over. They'll be here. They'll be here. What does a woe mean? A woe means this. Oh. A woe means this. This is what the world is, has been experiencing. Grief, sorrow, misery, a heavy calamity. A curse. We are now living, brothers and sisters, under a curse. We are now under a curse. The woe that we're under is a curse that God has put upon the world. And finally, a woe is used in denunciation and in exclamations of sorrow. So we're living in a woe, and we're living in a time of what? Denunciation. God is denouncing the earth because the earth has turned its back on him. And he's using and has been using the Muslims to, to execute this judgment. And he's also using the Seventh-day Adventist church to tell the world that the, we're in the judgment period. 
So God executes judgment and he uses the Seventh-day Adventist church to tell the world that we are living in the time of the judgment because we're living in the time of the seventh angel and the seventh angel began in 1844 and what did Christ do in 1844? He went to the most holy place and so in 1844 Christ going into the holy place to judge what does that mean what church period time are we in? Come on 1844 what church period time are we in? And Laodicea means Church judging, judging of the church. And so we're in the time of woe because either you're with God or you fall under woe. Mercy. When we look at the Muslims, when we look at the Muslims, remember we said last week, I said last week, that all those who espouse to world power all those who espoused to world power, whether it was Constantine, whether it was Napoleon, whether it was Peter the Great, whomever it was, everyone that espoused to world power, they didn't look at world power locally. They didn't look at world power from a perspective of their country, not even their region. They saw world power as the entire globe. Every one of those people from the past, they looked at the world from a global perspective. They wanted to control the entire globe. Not true, not true of world leaders today. World leaders just want to make sure that they are tyrant in their own country. And so when we look at, we look at what Constantine was doing, Constantine was establishing, was, was establishing his seat of government. But at the same time that Constantine was doing what he was doing, there was a group of people, the Muslims, who were also thinking about their future. And this right here is from the book, the Ottoman Empire, the Ottoman Turks, the Ottoman Turks by Edward Creasy, and I'll, I'll show you the reference in a moment. Such, according to the Oriental historian Nishri, is the first recorded exploits of that branch of the Turkish ra race, which from Ertugol's, look at that name, Ertugol's, guess what, Brother Henry? Guess what? The very he was the person who started the Ottomans. These people understand their history. These nations understand history. We have lost our desire for history. See, by the time we get to the week after next, we'll see how serious Erdogan takes his name. We'll see how Erdogan, I, don't wanna, I, don't wanna, I just want to make sure I give you a reason to come back. But Brother Henry hit the nail on the head. I was wondering if anybody was going to catch that. Which from Erdogan's son, Othman. See, they call it the Ottoman Empire, but Erdogan was the father of Othman, who, was, who started the nation of the Ottoman Turks. See, when you think about it, if you look in Scripture, you'll see many people, many of the patriarchs and many of the characters of the Bible use names that were names that were used before. Remember we talked about the Ptolemies. That, that was another prayer line. Remember the Ptolemies? And they used the name. They just kept using the name Ptolemy, Ptolemy. The Seleucids, they kept using the name. They kept using the name, remember? Cyrus' name was used twice. Cambyses' name was used twice because they wanted to have a name associated with a world power. And so when you see the name Erdogan, and Brother Mike brought it up, this, when I first saw this, I said, this looks just like Erdogan. I told my wife. So Erdogan was the father of Othman and has been called the nation of the Ottoman Turks. So Erdogan, I'm excuse me, so Erdogan, even though he was the first one, actually his son, Othman, started the nation called the Ottoman Turks. The Seleucian Turks. Now, there were lots of different branches of Turks, but this branch of the Turks was truly interesting. And history is going to tell us why. The Seleucian Turks were, were one masters, if, were, were, were all masters, if nearly all, all Asia Minor, of Syria, of Mesopotamia, Armenia, part of Persia, and Western Tur Tur uh, and Turkestan, and their great, and their great sultans, Turkal, Bag, Al Alsin and Malik Shah are among the most renowned conquerors that stand forth in Oriental and Byzantine history. See, when Constantine moved his government from Rome to Constantinople, it was originally called Byzantine, the land of the Greeks. 
Okay? But, but the experience of the Ottomans or the Turks, had already, they had already made some inroads there. But it was the Romans who pushed them further out. They stand forth in Oriental and in Byzantine history. We continue. The Turkish race has been extensively spread. Now think about it. This is the, this is the general, all Turkish race. But this is going to get more specific. The Turkish race had been extensively spread through Lower Asia long before the time of Ertegal, quitting or leaving their primitive abodes or houses on the upper steps of the Asiatic contact, continent, tribe after tribe of the martial family of nations. What does that word martial mean? Wow. Warlike. They were a warlike nation. What did we say about Ishmael's children? They were warlike. They would be a wild man. See, this is history. God said it was going to be like this. Isn't it amazing God can tell you what your character is going to be and you don't even realize it? I'm warlike and I don't even know why. They were warlike. They were a nation of warlike people. Marshall family of nations had poured down upon the rich lands and tempting wealth of the southern and western regions when the power of the caliphs that was the original spelling of it, K-H-A-L-I-F. Now they spell it C-A-L-I-P-H, which is the caliphs, or they will ultimately establish a caliphate. See, this is all history for these people, okay? The caliphs had decayed like that of the Greek emperors. One branch, one branch of the Turks called the Seljukians from their traditionary patriarch, Seljuk Khan, had acquired and consolidated a mighty empire more than two centuries before the name Ottoman was heard. They were a warlike people. God was keeping them, holding the Ottomans back until there was a time that he would need them. He was holding them back because what did he do? He released them on the Eastern Roman Empire, didn't he? We saw that with the Arabs and then the Turks. So right here, the historian says 200 years prior. He continues and says, one night, speaking of Othman, now remember, I want us to think about this, these people who have been world leaders from the past, Nebuchadnezzar, that's why he had the dream. He wanted to know what was going to be his empire, the future of his empire. Alexander, he had a dream, and the dream was what was going to happen when he got to Israel, and then, and then God had him have a dream that he would see the men dressed in white. All these people, Cyrus had a dream, all of them had dreams, and they had dreams of world dominance. And so one night, when Othman was resting, he fell asleep. And he dreamed a dream. Suddenly there arose a mighty wind and turned the points of the sword leaves toward various cities of the world, but especially Constantinople. Constantinople. That city, placed at the juncture of two seas and two continents, seemed like a diamond set before two sapphires and two emeralds to form the beautiful precious stone and a ring of a universal what empire. is he talking locally brothers and sisters is he talking about a continent is he talking about a hemisphere or is he talking about the whole world he had a dream that he would control the whole world Othman thought that he was in the act of placing the vision ring on his finger when he awoke history of the Ottoman Turks by E.S. Creasley and so that's been his goal ever since. That's been the goal. But that wasn't, that wasn't initially his goal. That was what actually, because of his character, it's been there. God said they would, be in the, they would dwell in the presence of what? All his brethren. Othman has always wanted, the Ottomans have always wanted a, a universal empire. Let's see the beginnings of it. So let's fast forward it. Let's fast forward and see how it, how it materialized. Let's see how it materialized, because even though he had that desire to have it, there still needed to be another, that another motivator. History of the World by John Clark Ridpath. And remember, this is a lot of history. I hope you understand this is a lot of history, and we got less than 10 minutes. By, um, John, Clark history, his, John Clark Ridpath tells us the following about Muhammad. So now we see that there's a character and the Muslims, there's something about them that gives them the desire that they want to control the world. Now, Mo now Muhammad, he starts, he has very simple beginnings. Ritpath says, while engaged in carrying on in the linen trade, he, Muhammad, became acquainted with the rich widow Khadija, living at a town 
of Hajjah, of Hajjah, her, though much older than himself, he presently married, thus obtaining a faithful wife and a large estate. He thereupon gave up the business of watching flocks and lived at Khadijah's home in Hajjah. What's, 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 what's wrong with this picture? What's wrong with this picture? Let me add to it this. Khadijah was 51. I'm sorry, Khadijah was 31, and Muhammad was 1920. What's wrong with that picture? Well, that's, that's, that's good to say married for the money. That's, that's, that's about right. That's right, almost right between the eyes. But Muslims marry women typically what? Younger. younger. Even Arabs marry women typically younger because the Muslim faith hadn't started by this time. So, he, so, so there was something unusual about this marriage. But Ridpath continues and says this. I'm sorry, I got the, I got the age wrong. From the age of 26 to 35, Muhammad passed the time as an ex, I think it was early 20s. From the age of 26 to 35, Mohammed passed the time as an Arab citizen in private life. About the year 594. Now, Revelation 8, I'm sorry, Revelation 9 brings us in to about 600. So here, this right here is lining up with prophecy. About the year 594, however, he was brought to the attention of his countrymen in a conspic conspicuous way. The idolatrous temple in Mecca was called the Kaaba. Anyone familiar with the Kaaba? This is all about the Eastern question, so we need to know these things. What is the Kaaba? You ever seen that big black box in, 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 um, in Arabia? You ever seen pictures of that big black box? Some have, some haven't. There's a big black box that's supposed to have been brought there by the Holy Spirit and dumped in the middle of uh, in Mecca. And they travel around it every year. You ever seen that big, y'all haven't seen that big black box? Okay, I'm going to have to, I'm gonna have to add, add that to one of my slides. Anyway, the idolatrous temple in Mecca was called the Kaaba. When the patriarch Abraham, look at how the Muslims saw themselves. When the patriarch Abraham lived at that place, the angel Gabriel gave him a white stone as an emblem of the original purity of the race. Over the stone, the temple was built with the growing wickedness of the world. The stone became as black as pitch. <laughs> this is Muslim history. This is Muslim history. This stone is probably a, about, as, about if you took this building, it's because it's cubical. It's, it's, it's the same size on each side. And the people, they come and they make their pilgrimage to Mecca and they travel around it and only real Muslims can go there. But this is not the reason for this information. The Kaaba had now become dilapidated and the edifice must be rebuilt. This was accordingly done, but when it came to the second, the, the, the sacred task of removing the black stone into its new resting place, the chiefs fell into a violent quarrels as to who should perform the work. At last it was agreed that the matter should be dedicated by arbitration and Muhammad was called from Hajisha to be the umpire. On coming to Mecca, he performed his difficult duty in a manner highly satisfactory to all concerned. It was the first public transaction of the prophet's life. So he gained notoriety with the Arabs in Mecca because he umpired just to say what, how the stone should be taken care of. His, uh, um, this path continues and says, It appears that the dispute of the chiefs about the black stone of the Kaaba made a profound impression on Muhammad's mind. To a man of his clear understanding, it is likely that the quarrel appeared in its naked absurdity. He may have said to Khadija on his return home that the fathers of the race, Abraham and Ishmael, would be ashamed of such wranglings as he had lately witnessed in Mecca. But we get a consistent message on what happened here. Now, oh, you, nobody, can, can you, nobody can see that, can they? That's hard to see. Can anybody see that? Huh? Yes, you can see it? This is a book, has anybody, anyone ever heard of, I think Brother Henry, you probably are familiar with this. Anyone ever heard of Jack Chick? Yeah. Just two people, three people. Jack Chick, Jack Chick. Yeah. Jack Chick makes yeah. some really, he has some information he has is really good, and some stuff is a little, it's not that he's way out, it's just that he, he doesn't have a good understanding of hell. But Jack Chick, 
what Jack Chick was able to get Alberta Rivera to do a comic book series. It's true, but it's done in a comic book form. And he does one about the prophet, and he's talking about Muhammad. And he tells us how the Catholic faith or the Catholic Church began the Muslim faith. Alberto Rivera was a Jesuit. They tried to kill him three times, and they were successful on the third time. And he tells us this and telling us how the Muslim faith got started. He said about 610, Muhammad claimed he had vision from Allah and a majestic being whom he called the angel Gabriel and said, you are the messenger of Allah. This began Muhammad's career as a prophet. I, mean, I can't even hardly see that myself. Okay. This began Muhammad's career as the prophet of Allah. From, the time on, from that time on, Muhammad continued to receive messages which he claimed came from Allah and until his death. With the help of his wife, with, with the help of his wife's Roman Catholic cousin, Waraka, the prophet was able to interpret these messages. Some of, the, some of the revelations were placed in the Quran in 650 AD. Other writings of Muhammad were never published. Okay. Oh, go back. Come on, go back. And the Vatican, and the Vatican, this was the cardinal who knew all the history of how the Muslim faith was started. Well, he wasn't the only one, but he was the teacher of the Jesuits, of which Alberto Rivera was one. He says, in the Vatican briefing, Cardinal Bay told us this. A wealthy Arabian lady who was, beautiful, who was a beautiful, beautiful follower of the Pope played a tremendous part in this drama. She was a widow named Khadijah. She had given her wealth to the mother church and repaired to the convent. While there, she was given a strange assignment and went back into the world. Her job was to find a brilliant young man who could be used by the Vatican to create a new religion and become the, the Messiah for the children of Ishmael. So you wonder who started Islam? Rome started. Now watch this. Because of time, I'm going to go ahead and just tell you this, but you can get the slides. Rome raised up Muhammad so that Muhammad could start an army and attack Israel. Because Rome wants to be at that seat, at that specific seat of power. They want to be where Israel is. And Rome influenced Ishmael to go down to Israel. After he, after Is, Is, not Ishmael, not Ishmael, but Muhammad and, and, Muhammad's, and Muhammad's army to go down there, 200,000 men. They went down to Israel and they routed Israel. But when, when the time for the payback came, the Muslims said, we're not going to give this land to you, the papacy. And here's what he says. He says, the Pope realized that what they had, what they had created was out, was out of control when they found out that the Muslims were calling His Holiness an infidel. And so the Muslims were inspired by Rome to go down and take Israel. But when they took Israel, they said to Rome, we will never give it back to you. Has anyone ever heard of the Crusades? What was the purpose of the Crusades? We talked about that a little bit last week. What was the purpose of the Crusades? All destroy the infidels, destroy the Muslims. The whole purpose of the, of the Crusades was to counter what the Muslims did. And so the Pope sent the Crusaders down to Israel to rout the Muslims and run them out of Israel. But they failed. And so we see all because of one man, we've seen something get out of control. Hold on. Oh, there it is right there. Out of the Roman Empire came the papacy. And out of the papacy came what? Islam. What did you say, Sister, what'd you say, Sister Jesse? The Muslims. The Muslims. The Muslims. Mm -hmm. Revelation 17 and 5, as I'm getting ready to wrap up. Revelation 13 and 5. I mean, 17 and 5. I might have to take a few extra minutes because I've got to do that this today.
Revelation 17 and 5. We're going to skip what I wrote. Just look at Revelation 17 and 5. What, is the, what does the Bible say in Revelation uh, 17 and 5? And, uh, and upon her, go ahead, Sister, go ahead, Sister Jordan. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And so we see here that the Islam faith was started by who? It was started by the papacy. To do what? What was the purpose of the papacy starting up the Muslim faith? To take the land that Israel was on. But, but we won't find out how that actually happened until, until a couple of weeks from now. So when did Turkey take Constantinople and thus the, the, the northern division of ancient Greece and Rome? Because remember, it was started by Constantine, who started the Eastern Question, but Turkey, but Turkey ultimately took Constantinople. It tells us this. And the breaking up, Bible readings of the home circle, and the breaking up of the Roman Empire, the Turks gained possession of the Holy Land in 1058 AD, and finally of Constantinople and considerable portions of, the Eastern Europe, of Eastern Europe, the Kingdom of the North, in 1453, to which, with valiant fortunes and shrinking geographical boundaries, it has held ever since. This was by 1888. The pioneers in 1888 still saw Constantinople or all, of, or all of actually the Middle East, Northern Africa, and parts of Eastern Europe as all being under control of the, of the Ottoman Empire. Why in 1888 were they still seeing this? Why were they still seeing this in 1888? They were still living, but there's, a, there's one, more, one more thing that, ha that hadn't happened yet. In 1888, who had control of Israel? Come on, we've been studying this. Remember, Rome raised up the Muslims to, uh, to attack Israel, right? right? When did Israel, or when did the people of Israel get that land back? 1948. So in 1888, this land was still under the control of the Muslims. It was still under the control of the Muslims. And so at that time, brothers and sisters, when the Muslims were under the control, it was a really, no one could ever see how Israel would come back on the scene. But it didn't make a difference because world leaders still wanted to have control of that part of the land. These are my last couple of slides. I won't get through them all. So let's go back to a world leader. Let's go back to how the world leaders saw that land that Turkey is in and how them pushing Turkey out would ultimately cause Daniel 11.45. Here's Peter the Great, and he says this about this land. Nevertheless, the conquest of Turkey, the possession of Constantinople, and the command of the passage between the Mediterranean and the Black Sea have long been the avowed purpose of... Peter the Great cherished this ambition two centuries ago and left in his sacred legacy to his, his, to his successors. Now, we already, we already saw that, right? Okay. Ever since the days of Peter the Great, Russia has cherished the idea of driving the, cre driving the crescent. What's the crescent? What are you saying, Sister, Sister Sue, Susan? It's the moon. And where do you see the crescent? On the flag of the Russians. I mean, on the flag of the, of the Turks, right? Okay, so Russia has cherished the idea of driving the crescent from the soil of Europe. That famous prince, becoming sole emperor of Russia in 1688, at the age of 16, enjoyed a prosperous reign of 37 years to 1725 and left his successors a celebrated last will and testament, imparting certain important instructions for their constant observance. The ninth article of that will enjoined the following policy. We read that policy twice. We're not going to read it a third time. But let's see how that policy has been, according to A.T. Jones, undeviatingly, this policy has been followed by the czars. It will appear from the extract from Russian history. Now, remember what Peter the, Peter the Great told them to do. Take that land, take that land, but ultimately try to get Constantinople. Take all of the land around them, and you will ultimately get that. Histor historically, we see this. In 1696, Peter the Great wrested the seal of Azov from the Turks and kept it. 
Next, Catherine the Great won Crimea. In 1812, by the peace of Bucharest, Alexander I obtained Moldovia and the, and the, and the prettily named province of Bessarabia, Bessarabia with its apples, peaches, and cherries. Then came the great Nicholas, who won the right of the free navigation of the Black Sea, the Dardanelles, and the Danube. Is Peter the Great's wishes being fulfilled? Had they been fulfilled by them? Do you think Putin doesn't know these things? You don't think, you think Putin don't know these? He does. And look, brothers and sisters, every single one of these people, I turned it too fast. Every single one of these people, I'm not, I promise I'm, 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 gonna, I'm gonna get this finished up, and if I don't finish it, I'll have to finish it next week. Every one of these followed what Peter the Great said to the letter. They started taking as much of the Russian Empire as they possibly could. Give me just a minute and I'm going to be done. Tsar Alexander and Napoleon the Great have a talk and see what they say. Constantinople with its, tribu with its tributary straits or waterlands is the most strategic site in the world. When Napoleon and the Tsar Alexander, those two pictures you just saw, sat down at Tilsit to divide the world between them, Alexander is said to have pleaded with Napoleon, give or take what you will, but give us Constantinople. For Constantinople, my people are prepared to make any sacrifice. Napoleon bent over the map and then straightening up with a sudden resolution replied, Constantinople, what? Never. Why? Nothing has happened since to discredit this judgment. Merchant and strategists alike still rank Constantinople as the most valuable of territorial possessions. It is now, as it was a century ago, the center of the world's strategy, and as such, it must be accounted the chief issue in the present world war. And this is not the first war, nor will it be the last to be waged for its possession. We ran out of time. World War, III. World War III is imminent. Were you here, Jordan, when I showed the video? When I showed the CNN? Turkey on the, Turkey is on the, the Turkish troops are on the line. Brothers and sisters, we are literally looking at the very edge of, we're on, we're on the edge of it. I got to go because it's 630 and I've already gone over time. We're going to continue here next week. We're going to continue here next week because we have to bring Constantine and the Turks closer together so you can see how this Eastern question and Napoleon uh, brings us to Daniel 1140 and Daniel 11 to Daniel 1145 because that's when Napoleon truly enters into the Eastern question. Sister Olga? Um, what is the significance of ISIS surrendering this week and you know they have masses of soldiers of ISIS? Okay this is good this is good can I, can I answer? Can I answer? Okay, let's look at this real quick. Open your Bibles to Daniel, I'm sorry, um, Revelation 9. Revelation 9. It's a smoke screen, but you need to see this. Revelation 9. Uh, Revelation 9 and verse uh, 12, let me see. Um, um, 200. Okay, Revelation 9 and 16. You, are we there, Revelation 9, 16? And the number of the army of horsemen were what? 200,000, thousand. 200,000, thousand, and I heard the number of them. According to the, P, the Pew Research Group, there are somewhere in the neighborhood, if you, go, if you do 200,000, thousand, you multiply that out, you know what that number comes to? 200 million. 200 million. According to the Pew Research, there are 200 million million radical Islamic people throughout the world. And so that the ISIS thing is just to distract and make you think it's not an issue. The Bible says that they will be around, the Arabs will be around until the end of time. And that right there, this 200,000 200, thousand represents the number of Muslims that at any time could blow up something. So Islam, I mean ISIS is, ISIS um, what's the other name? The Al Qaeda. What's the other ones? All those. 
Taliban, all those are just distractions because you have two factions. The ISIS, ISIS at one time said they wanted to establish a caliphate, but there's only going to be one true caliphate. ISIS, would have, would, ISIS or whomever would establish a false caliphate. A caliphate is the Muslim equivalent of a pope. Erdogan is establishing himself as the true caliphate. And so when you have these people who are so extreme to the left, like ISIS, the world is more than willing to accept someone like Erdogan. So when you see, when you see ISIS saying we're giving up, it's just a distraction because the real, the real issue is what is Erdogan going to do? So ISIS is just, it's just another distraction, just like this Korea issue. It's just a distraction unless, you know, the, unless the person in the White House gets really kooky for Cocoa Puffs. Does that make sense, Sister, Sister Olga? Come on, Sister Olga. I'm listening. Well, see, you have to, we have to realize that radical Islam, are, they are far to the left of their religion. Far to the left of their religion. But, and they believe that you know, if, you die, if you die as a martyr, you're going to get how many virgins? You're going to get seven virgins and all this, that, and the other. So it's easy for them to recruit more and more radical Islam. So when, when ISIS disappears, just like the Taliban disappeared, or the Taliban became quieter, or the um, Al Qaeda become quiet, another one just comes on the scene. When we looked at the video earlier; it showed us another group. So you're saying that they're just um, saying, "Okay, we're going to back down, but come up in a different way." The people behind those organizations typically are the CIA, the Mossad, MI6. Um, the KGB, the people who really start those groups up, those are the same ones. And who, Brother Henry, who started all those intelligence organizations? The papacy, the Jesuits. The Jesuits. Every single one of those was started by the KGB, the CIA, the Mossad, MI5. All of them, were, they were started, but they came out of the mines because it's all of the, all the inquisition. They're not going to let you know what they do out in front, so they stand back. And so when they get one quiet, they just raise up another. And they get that one quiet, they just raise up another. Mm -hmm. But the Bible tells us 200,000, 200 million, there are 200 million radical Islamic right now, according to peer research, and that's a conservative number. Mm -hmm. That's a conservative number. So no matter what happens, we have to, be, we have to realize that the Eastern question really comes down to getting who is in Turkey out of Turkey so that the other nations can have those resources, but basically Turkey wants to have Israel so it can set up its palace and its tabernacle so it can retake what they feel was taken from them illegally in 1948 and World War II. All right? Let's stop right there. That's the good thing about class as opposed to a sermon. We can stop right there and go ahead and um, get on to our prayer session. So let's have a word of prayer that will close and open up prayer time. Amen? Father in heaven, again, we thank you for this day and for the blessings, for your mercy and your kindness towards us. Lord, we don't want to have a, a loss of collective memory. As we learned earlier, it has been because of a loss of collective memory that we have been hoodwinked. We have been bamboozled into believing one thing when, Father, you never changed. You say, I am the Lord God, I change not. And there is no shadow of turning to you. And so, Lord, we ask that you will forgive us for our slothfulness with our time and that you will show us exactly what you would have us to do in giving the three angels messages and understanding what it is that we are to do for this community, for our families for our relatives and for all those who come in contact with us. And as we also open up this time for prayer, we ask that you will be with us, guide and direct and order our steps, Lord. This is our prayer we ask. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.